Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, a warm welcome to everyone who's here in person and an equally warm welcome to all the people who are watching this online. Uh, my name is Suleiman Ijaz. Uh, I'm the head of strategy for Engro Corporation and I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to Engro Sustainability Week. I'd like to begin uh, today with a short anecdote uh, about my son Ibrahim who is five years old. Uh, some time ago I asked Ibrahim if he could throw something in the trash. So I said, okay Abu, he walked and he threw it in the trash. A few weeks later I asked him again, uh, Ibrahim can you throw something in the trash? And so he musters up all the sass that only a five-year-old can and he says, Abu, don't you know that goes in recycling? I was gobsmacked. This was COVID. The guy doesn't even go anywhere. So I said, Ibrahim, that's wonderful. I'm glad you know about the importance of recycling. Where did you learn this? And he says, Peppa Pig. Now, this little anecdote underlines the first of four messages that I'll give today which is that the sustainability transition has reached a tipping point. And companies will now be held to account for the externalities of their actions as time goes by. And I think this video gives us a flavor of how people are thinking about this. My second message is, why is this relevant for Pakistani companies? Is this just someone else's problem 10,000 miles away or do we have to think about it? My third message is a playbook for how companies can navigate the period ahead, which we have developed uh, under EngroCorp's leadership. And finally, just a few words about why uh, we are having this event. But I'll start with the sustainability transition. So today, 68% of the world's GDP is covered by a carbon net zero commitment. That's more than two thirds. In 2018, this number was zero. So why this sudden change? It, it turns out uh, through our research, we have learned that this push for sustainability is driven by general public awareness. The general public influences regulators with their votes. It influences companies with their consumption. It influences financiers. And these players in turn influence disruptors who create technologies and so on and so forth. And when general public awareness reaches a critical mass, whoosh, the whole thing takes off. So today, 81% of global consumers feel that companies need to do more for climate change. So now what does this mean for companies? What this means is, as I said, companies are going to be held to account for the externalities of their actions in three areas broadly environmental social and governance what's happening is society is beginning to place costs on those companies that will be perceived as unsustainable what form will these costs take reduced access to talent reduced access to capital missed first mover advantage, running afoul of regulations, and the good old economic cost, running afoul of changing consumer preference. Now, for some companies who remain unsustainable, these are costs. For other companies who act decisively and become sustainable, these can be opportunities. No industry illustrates this better than the electric vehicle industry. It's a reasonably well-known fact that the market capitalization of Tesla is bigger than the next eight most valuable companies. You know, so that's a reasonably well-known fact. But did you know that the market cap of Tesla is 2.5 times the GDP of Pakistan? That's a sustainable company. Now my second message. Why is this relevant for Pakistan? Is this just a problem from 10,000 miles away? Well, first of all, we're in the middle of a climate crisis. Pakistan is one of the five most climate change vulnerable countries in the world. And even the best of businesses would struggle if there's six feet of water outside. But even moving on from that, if today a Pakistani company does business with the rest of the world or aspires to do business with the rest of the world, 
that company is already being held to account by Western standards. As the Honorable Minister for Climate Change will share with us, some of the companies in Pakistan that are the most advanced in their sustainability preparations are exporters. And finally, even if you are not a company that is international or has aspirations, imminently the accountability will come. Pakistan has already made a net zero commitment for 2050. That will not be achieved overnight. It will take time. And as our chief executive Riyas will explain, the trajectories for developing countries cannot be the same as developed countries, but it will happen. And if that weren't enough incentive, Google search trends show that young Pakistani people are as passionate about climate change as their foreign peers. So employees will be holding employers to account. So this brings us then to our third message. How should companies respond to this? What's a rational playbook to navigate these coming years? Over the last year, Engro Corporation has invested significant effort to answer this exact question. Uh, just last month, uh, my colleague Hussein and I visited the US. We met 12 of the world's top corporations. We met industrials. We met consumer-facing companies. We met financiers. And not to worry, we are offsetting the carbon of that trip through the Engro Foundation by planting trees. One of the companies we met was Honeywell. Honeywell has cut their carbon emissions from 22 million tons to 2 million tons. And later today, we will hear from their chief sustainability officer, Evan, who is gracing this event and was very generous to share his time with us on how they achieved that. In addition, along with our other colleagues, Zulfikar, we've held about 100 Zoom calls with policymakers, consultants, other con companies, experts. And if we put all of these learnings together, we can synthesize it into a three-part playbook that the world's best companies are following. And that playbook is scorecard, culture, delivery mechanism. And I'll say a little bit about each one. A scorecard is reasonably obvious. It's a set of metrics, KPIs with targets. Uh, typically, companies cover carbon footprint, plastic, water, biodiversity, diversity and inclusion, community impact, these kinds of issues. You have a scorecard. It is externally communicated, and there are bodies that exist which validate the targets as being consistent with science. So that's the scorecard. It is the extent of a company's publicly committed amb ambitions. The second step is culture. Uh, the following will be familiar to many of you. Um, you know, in, in, I'll just explain with an example. In any industrial company, let's say two people get in a car, and one is slow to put on his seatbelt. The other will for sure say, health and safety, please put on your seatbelt. That's not in any KPI. No one's watching. No one's monitoring that the second person do that. It is part of the culture. We are all very proud to have a world-class health and safety culture at Engro. And the world's top corporations are busy inculcating cultures of sustainability as a critical means to achieve their sustainability ambitions. So it's scorecard, culture, and delivery mechanisms. In order to achieve results, ESG must be embedded in investment divestment, performance management, baselining, data gathering, disclosure, research and development, partnerships, etc. So this is a generalized playbook. Now, you must be thinking, well, gee, that sounds like a lot of effort. And it is. It requires resources, real resources. It requires time, uh, uh, management bandwidth, which is possibly the most valuable commodity, capex. Uh, it, it requires opex margins, investments foregone. And as any CEO will tell you, every company has other strategic imperatives that are also very important for the company's survival. Companies may be expanding, they may be diversifying, they may be cutting costs, they may be developing people, they may be doing any number of things which are also essential for their survival. So at its heart, navigating this transition is about making trade-offs. Companies have to make trade-offs between allocating hard resources to their critical strategic imperatives while also keeping an eye on sustainability. The 
the hypothesis, and it's a hypothesis, that is animating this process when you talk to top Western companies. The hypothesis is that the cost of getting it wrong by underinvesting is greater than the cost of getting it wrong by overinvesting. No one knows this, but people are thinking that this may be the case. As a result of this, what you see is companies are putting sustainability at the heart of business strategy, which is exactly the leadership that our board and chief executive have shown. We have also put sustainability in our business strategy. And companies abroad are putting significant time and effort. They're investing this time to make sure they get these trade-offs right. So this brings us to our fourth message. Why are we doing this event? Fighting climate change is not a zero-sum game. It's a joint effort between mutually reinforcing sets of stakeholders. This includes the private sector, it includes government, it includes the general public. We should help each other. We hope that this event raises awareness of the climate emergency. We hope it acts as a thought starter. We hope it initiates a dialogue. And so that's why we're having Engro Sustainability Week. Uh, just very quick thanks. Uh, I would like to thank the strategy team. Uh, this effort has been led by Zulfikar, uh, supported by Hussein and the entire team. They've worked tirelessly to deliver this in no particular order. I would like to thank the CEO office, the executive committee, corporate communications, people, government relations, Engro Foundation, IT, central procurement, and of course our hosts, KSPL. Uh, finally, I would love to thank our speakers, our physical attendees, and our Zoom attendees. You guys are the event.